great singing. Thank you. Again, if you are live streaming, you'll want this handout. The instructions are there online on where to find it. Jason will bring that up for you. And it looks like this. It's topic number two. It gets a little bit longer every week because uh, we go a little bit further in it. And by the time we're finished, you'll have a complete and finished handout. I'm not sure how far we'll go tonight, but it's there for you. Um, and that will be a big help to you. If you are joining us for the first time, we are in a series on basic discipleship. And we are really covering the nuts and bolts of the Christian life. Very, very important truths in these days. Let's go ahead and we'll commit our time to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Now, Father, we thank you for your word that's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Lord Jesus, you said, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Thank you that you change us as our minds are renewed so that we need not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, metamorphosized. Thank you for the power of your word, that it's the seed that brought about the new birth that the Spirit uses. And thank you, you promised that as we would long for it, like a newborn babe, we longs for milk, that we can grow in respect to our salvation. So we come with hungry hearts tonight. And Holy Spirit, we need your help as the teacher, as the illuminator of truth, this book that you inspired each and every writer to pen. Thank you for your ministry to us as the teacher. And so now we uh, humble ourselves before you, Lord, and we pray that because of our exposure to the word of God tonight, that we would be different people and that this process of sanctification of becoming more and more like Jesus until he takes us home would be further completed. So we ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so this is a course on New Testament discipleship. And as you can see, tonight's topic that we began last week is experiencing forgiveness and fellowship with God. Several objectives. We want to understand the doctrine of sin as it relates to actions, attitudes, and what we call doubtful things. To be able to relate four governing principles to what sometimes are referred to as gray areas, doubtful things, or disputable matters. Uh, to recognize three forces that we battle with as Christians, to distinguish between positional versus experiential forgiveness, to recognize the importance of confession for the believer in keeping our lives clean and clear and filled with the Spirit, and to discern the difference between real guilt and false guilt. And then with each handout, we are memorizing two verses of Scripture. So last week, we started on the doctrine of sin. And just by the introductory paragraph there, you can read it in a day when people think that truth is relative or cannot be discovered at all. There is a tendency to describe sin as psychological maladjustments, errors in judgment, glandular malfunctions. So it's important that we can define sin biblically. Uh, we first defined sin. We looked at three central passages. One, sin is a failure to do what is right. James says to the one who knows to do right and does it not, to him it is sin. We saw that sin is a transgression of God's law. 1 John 3 says that sin is lawlessness. It's just breaking God's law. And so in Ephesians 2, we examine that text, and Paul reminds us that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We saw that the word for trespass is actually a compound word in the Greek New Testament. It literally means a false step. In other words, there's a known path that God calls us to walk on, and we've deviated from it. And so it speaks really of sins of commission, going against what God has commanded us to do. But then there are sins of omissions. So he speaks of being dead in transgressions and sins. And so we saw the word sin, whether it's used as a verb, to describe the action, whether it's used as an adjective to describe the person, or whether it's used as a noun to describe the end result. In all cases, it simply means to miss the mark, to fall short. So we have fallen short of God's expectations that he has for us, and we've deviated from known paths. Then, uh, point B there on your outline, we began to examine sin as it is described. 
Most often in the New Testament, it is described in terms of actions. And so we looked at a number of passages where God just says, this is wrong, period. He doesn't equivocate what he says. He says what he means. He means what he says. But we also saw that sometimes sin can be described not just in terms of an action, but in terms of attitudes. And this was very important in the Sermon on the Mount in six illustrations that the Lord gives as he really tears the rug out from underneath the Pharisees who could point to external laws that they had obeyed, but internally they were at fault. So Jesus said to look at a woman to lust at her is to commit adultery. They said, well, I've never committed adultery. Jesus said, you have in your heart. And so he was showing them that unless their righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, they had never entered the kingdom of God because they had an external righteousness such that Jesus can say to hate your brother is to be a murderer. So sometimes sin is described in terms of actions, sometimes in terms of attitudes. Every sin, point three, B3, every sin is not delineated in Scripture, but God gives us some principles to discern whether something is sinful. Um, And so we can see on this chart, on the one side, we have what we would call the negative commands of Scripture. Don't do this. On the other side, we have the positive commands of Scripture. Do this. And in between is what we might call the gray areas of life. Uh, They are called disputable matters, the non-absolutes of Scripture. But if you understand the principles that govern these areas, then they don't really become gray at all. They become quite black and white. And so um, we're going to look at these A, B, C, and D tonight at least, that we're not to do anything that would cause another brother to stumble that whatever cannot be done in faith from a clear conscience is considered sin, that whatever cannot be done to glorify God is sin, and whatever appears to be evil by choices we make lessens our testimony for God and therefore is sin as well. So um, let's look at a central passage of Scripture that really describes this. Turn to the book of Romans, would you? Romans chapter 14. Romans, the 14th chapter. The book of Romans has three major divisions. There's the doctrinal section, one through eight, where he deals with the doctrine of condemnation, justification, and sanctification. Then the national section is nine through 11. He shows how Israel was elected out of all the nations of the world. He shows in the 10th chapter how Israel is in unbelief. And in the 11th chapter, how Israel will be Restored, And so it's not a parenthesis. It's actually a continuation of what he's argued in chapters 1 through 8 because he finishes the end of 8 saying, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so people might think, well, God, you said you loved Israel with an everlasting love. It seems like you have forsaken them. And so he says, no, not at all. I have not forsaken them. I am faithful to the people of Israel. I elected them out of all the nations of the world. Nine. They are in unbelief. They have not been rejected by me. They have rejected me. But I will keep my promises, and in the future, I will restore them. And the plans of God are being set for that future restoration. So then when you come to chapter 12, therefore, because of the mercies of God that he has spent 11 chapters describing. Here's how we're to behave. And so in 12 through 15, he deals with gifts. He deals with gray areas and um, and, uh, gifts in 12, government in 13, gray areas in 14 and 15, and then he comes to a conclusion. So that's where we are here in Romans chapter 14. So again, there are some things, there's no if, ands, and buts about it. God says this is what we should do. Some things are just spelled out. Some things, though, fall there in the middle. What, again, we call gray areas. What kind of entertainment can I enjoy? Uh, what kind of movies can I watch? What kind of music is pleasing to the Lord? And depending where you are in the world, 
the list is very different. And depending where you are in this age, it changes all the more. Uh, there was a time when I suppose these issues and these principles were at the forefront of evangelicalism. Not anymore. We've gone to the other extreme. Maybe there were times when Christians were characterized by legalism. And legalism is when you do something with the wrong motivation. Sometimes a Christian does something that's not legalistic at all because they are doing it for the glory of God. And sometimes today, if you have a standard, you're called legalistic. When in reality, that person is not legalistic. The person who's condemn, condemning them is guilty of license. And that's really where the evangelical church is today. Our liberty has become license. And we justify all kinds of things that God says are wrong. So I was just reading of a Baptist church that has a night called Beer and Hymn Night. That's what they have, Beer and Hymn Night. Um, another church in Seattle, Washington, they call themselves the Beer Church. In the Reformed movement, it's a big deal to drink alcohol, to smoke cigars, sometimes to gamble. The seminary that they asked for my resume because they wanted to consider me to be president. I said, well, have you changed your view on alcohol since Dr. Pentecost and Dr. Toussaint and Dr. Hendricks died in the last three years? You've come up with a new view on alcohol that you did not hold for nearly 100 years. What enlightened you? Moody Bible Institute. Once a great institution is fledgling, it's falling, it's failing. The whole dorm now is empty. I think God's discipline is over that school. They said the faculty can drink, smoke, and gamble in moderation. You see, we've become enlightened. And we've substituted standards and principles for license, and we are embracing things that we should not embrace. So Paul in this chapter of Scripture doesn't give us so much a rule book as it gives us a guidebook. The Bible is not a book of minute laws. It's a book of great principle. And if you understand the principle, then you can really walk in balance. You can walk in freedom. And that's what God did. He came to set us free. Look how the, we'll pick it up in verse 13. I, I could preach three weeks on this chapter, but look at verse 13. He says, therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. Now stop right there for a moment. This statement is qualified by the Apostle Paul in other passages of Scripture. So today, if you have a standard, I was sitting in a restaurant with two Christian leaders. All of you know their names. I'm not going to say who they are out of love. And we got into this issue on alcohol. And one of them said, well, Spurgeon liked to drink a beer and smoke a cigar. You know, and today, if you have a standard, you're considered legalistic. And of course, in unbelieving world, and sometimes even believers, because there's so much biblical ignorance in our day, they'll quote Matthew 7, do not judge lest you be judged. But let's remember, even in the context of Matthew 7, Jesus is asking us to exercise judgment or discernment. He tells us not to cast our pearl before swine. That is a judgmental decision on when to withhold the gospel pearl and when to give it. In John 7, 24, he says, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. So the scripture actually commands us to judge. So when Paul says here, therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, let's give the guy some credit because he underscores a number of areas in which Christians are to exercise judgment. For instance, he tells us that we are to judge an erring brother. A church right now that I know of in Virginia is being sued 
for, impl- for firing one of their employees who is living with a woman with whom he's not married, and now she's pregnant. And the Supreme Court decision that recently came down is going to have huge ramifications on the evangelical church, where they took the act of 1964 and redefined sex, where sex in its original context and that great act that was very necessary to prevent people from unjustly being discriminated, it's no longer male versus female. They've taken the noun and they've turned it into a verb. And so they've been enlightened to say, well, sex is defined according to your sexual preference. And of course, if our Senate is overcome with Democrats. They're short of the votes right now. They will pass the Equality Act. Sounds like a great act until you read it because then they are gonna codify in writing what you can and cannot do as a business, as a church. I mean, it will be very tricky you could hire a custodian and the custodian comes out as a transgender person. You say, I'm sorry, you can't work for me anymore. The Equality Act will have huge ramifications. I was speaking with a Christian organization this week and this guy is all into the monuments and I said, hey, that's great, but look, what what are you doing with enlightening Christians on some of the critical issues that are coming up in the next election? So one, God tells us that we are to judge erring Christians. Paul, if you remember in 1 Corinthians 5, says it's actually reported among you. It's the word reported is akuo. It's it's broadcast. It's well known in the whole church. We got our word echo from it. That there's immorality among you and even of the kind that the pagans find distasteful. Someone has his father's wife. Someone was sleeping with his stepmother. And Paul rebukes the church there in Corinth. He says their so-called tolerance is nothing but arrogance. And they should have exercised church discipline and dealt with that erring brother. And so the scripture is clear that we, we are to exercise what's called church discipline. That's a judgment that God calls every local assembly to make. Most people don't even know what church discipline is today because everything's accepted under the banner of tolerance. We're also to judge false doctrine. Paul will later say here in the book of Romans, when you come to chapter 16 and verse 17, he says, I urge you to keep your eye on those who would cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the doctrine that I delivered to you, Romans 16, 17. So we are to exercise judgment with false teachers. Jesus said, beware the false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly there are ravenous wolves. John says that we are to test the spirit, that not every spirit is from the Lord. And so we are to hold to what is good. We are to spurn that which is wrong. That's a form of of judgment. Not only are we to judge Aryan brothers and false teachers, the Bible teaches we're to judge ourselves. We come to the Lord's table, and it's a time of self-examination, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And he reminded the Corinthian church that because some of them came to the table and took in their hands the very elements that represented the incredible price that was paid, not so that they could serve the world, but so that they could serve the Savior, for they had been bought with a price. They were eating and drinking judgment unto themselves. He said, for this reason, a number of you are weak and sick, and some are asleep. That is, some have died prematurely sooner than God had wanted. But he said, if you had judged yourselves rightly, then God would not have disciplined you. So understand when Paul says we're not to judge, 
It has to be put in the context even of the book of Romans and the whole of Scripture. Again, here in verse 13, Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine, or actually it's the same word, judge again. It's a play on words. Crino. Therefore, do not judge one another, but rather judge this or determine this. And some translations bring that out. And he tells us that we are not to put a stumbling block in a brother's way. Look at verse 14, and let me explain a little bit further. He said, I know a man convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. Now, in every generation, there are different issues. And in every culture, there are different issues. You go to the church in India, and they were asking me. I had about 300 pastors I was teaching at a pastor's conference, and they wanted to know why women in America wore slacks. <laughs> And, you know, that was an issue. And if you notice our Indian brethren, and I'm sure some of them are live streaming, you won't typically ever see them in slocks. Because in that culture, it's typically viewed as immodest. Well, there's nothing wrong with wearing slocks. Sometimes people take a verse out of context. Hey, you know, a woman should not dress up in a man's clothing. He's actually speaking about transvestitism. He's not speaking about... In fact, uh, when Moses pens that, there were no pants. In fact, there were no pants during the entire biblical age of biblical recording, Old or New Testament. So he's not referring to that, but he is referring to what we might call cross-dressing. And the biblical principle, which many of our Indian brothers capture well, is modesty. They want to be modest. And that's what we are to exercise. Now, a woman could wear a dress, and it could be incredibly immodest. She could wear slacks, and it could be totally modest. So again, the key here is not per se a rule, but a principle. You go to some parts of the world in Eastern Europe, and there's an issue of head coverings that are going on. Because if a woman does not wear a head covering then it was typically understood that she was rebellious against her husband's authority. So you can go into, and it's beginning to change, but it's still generally true in Moldavia and Romania and Ukraine and Russia and all these former Soviet Eastern Orthodox satellites. You can look out at a congregation, you can see everyone who's married and everyone who's single. <laughs> All the married women have a head covering on. I mean, if a guy is single, he knows who's available right off. It's pretty convenient in that respect, I suppose. And so, you know, some of the women don't like the fact that some of the younger women who are married don't wear head coverings. So these are issues in different cultures, depending where you are in the world. But there are principles that God gives us for trying to figure out these areas that are not specifically spelled out. And so here he's speaking about clean and unclean meats. And if you know the first half of the chapter, he's dealing, of course, in the church at Rome with a mixed church. It's Jew and Gentile. And um, in other churches, like the Corinthian church, it was another issue altogether. Uh, the clean and unclean, or the holy versus the unholy meat, concerned where you bought it. Understand, this is the first century. There's no refrigeration. And so you might go to the temple of Zeus and offer that false god some sacrifice. And you would bring your best if you were a pious worshiper. So typically you'd find the best meats at a pagan temple. But they didn't use the whole animal. They just used a portion of the animal for the sacrifice. And the rest of it was sold by their priests as good meat. And so a debate in the first century is, should we buy meat at this pagan temple? Uh, amongst the Jewish brethren, which is what he's focusing here, is versus clean versus unclean meat. And by that is under the old covenant, there are two central passages, Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14, that deal with the subject of what God allowed a Jew to eat or not to eat. What was the big deal? Well, under the old covenant, God distinguished his people externally. Maybe the best modern day example you could find in the United States, apart from the Orthodox community, would be like the Amish. 
a lot of the Amish are, you know, somewhat different by the way they relate to the world system. They're distinguished. Well, in biblical times, under the old covenant, God distinguished his people externally. There's certain kinds of cloth they could wear, certain kinds of hairstyle, how you cut the sides of your head, foods that you ate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Under the new covenant, God distinguishes us differently. The promise of the new covenant, I will put a new heart and a new spirit within you. And I'll remove the heart of stone and I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'll place my spirit in you. And so God now distinguishes us not externally, but internally. And so you had this issue in the early church of what you could do or couldn't do. And there are two central passages under the new covenant that codifies what freedom a Jew and a Gentile have. But put yourself, you grew up Jewish. Remember the early church for the first couple of years is virtually entirely Jewish. There are Gentile proselytes, I'm sure, but early on, it's all Jewish. And then when you come to Acts 8, you have a mixed breed. They're half Jew, half Gentile. You come to Acts 10, and you have the first Gentile converts. So up until Acts 10, there's no record of any Gentiles being converted. So it's an all-Jewish church. Jews who believe Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah. So you grew up in a Jewish home. You followed the laws of a kosher diet your whole life. And now Gentiles are coming into the church, and they never followed the laws of a kosher diet. They enjoyed eating ham. They liked eating shrimp and lobster and oysters and the scavengers that God describes in Scripture. And he delineates really clearly what you can eat and what you can't eat. So you're a Gentile brother, and you invite your Jewish friend over, and you've got ham and shrimp on a skewer that you're barbecuing. And he thinks, what are you doing? I don't have the freedom to eat that. And of course, uh, you might want to hold your finger here and just turn back a few pages to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. And um, Jesus is dealing with the religious leaders and, you know, they're making all the right formations and jumping through all these different hoops and because of these external things thought they were just fine with God. And that's the way even most Gentiles think in our day, that we earn righteousness. It's not gifted to us. And so he says in 719, Mark 7, or look at 718, and he said to them, are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach and is eliminated. And thus he declared all foods clean. Now that's missing in some later manuscripts. But in all the early manuscripts, it's there. He declares all meats clean. And Paul will affirm that truth, not to mention God will illustrate the truth with Peter. Remember in Acts 10, Peter had some contention in the church, as the book of Galatians brings out by the way he uh, ate with certain Gentiles, and Paul accused him of hypocrisy. And of course, God gives him this vision, this sheet that comes down, and it's filled with all these unclean animals, three times for emphasis, and God says to Peter, take and eat. Now, understand, God never, ever, anywhere in Scripture uses an illustration with error in it to teach truth. God, who is truth, the spirit of truth, only uses truth to teach truth. And so in every illustration that Jesus tells, every parable he tells, truth is used to teach truth. And so in Acts 10, God makes it clear to Peter. He says, I can't eat that. God says, you can. Now, it's not about food. The whole point of the illustration is for him to understand the relationship between Jew and Gentile. And Paul, as the epistles are written, reminds us that the dividing wall between Jew and Greek is removed, and God has made us into one people. And so he says in verse 14 here, back in Romans, uh, 
He said, I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. But to him who thinks anything to be unclean, it is unclean. So if you grew up in a Jewish background and you were taught you can't eat shrimp, and you come over to my house as a Gentile and I'm barbecuing shrimp, and in your mind, I can't eat that, then it's unclean for you. You don't have the freedom in your conscience to eat that. And a good principle and a good rule of thumb that Paul will bring out in this chapter that we could paraphrase with the words, when in doubt, cut it out. If you think something in your mind and your heart is wrong, then you shouldn't do it. And sometimes God will say to one believer, you have the freedom to do this. But to another believer, he'll put a check in their heart and say, you don't have the freedom to do this. And God can often lead by that. I remember when we first came to Beaufort, there was a family that kept trying to befriend our family. And the dad said, hey, you know, we just, our sons, your sons, let's get them together. And, and you know, I'm going to the park on Saturday and... I said, well, thank you, but, um, you know, we, we've got other commitments. And every time this dad would ask, I would just say no. And I couldn't tell you why. And my sons asked me one day, they said, Dad, he's always asking us, he even asked us to go camping, and you said no. I said, well, I'll take you camping. I have before. Not that I enjoy it. <laughs> I like these guys who have these big motor homes. <laughs> now, that's camping, I'll tell you what. I'd had enough of it in the Boy Scouts for years and years. But in either case, I said, I don't know why, guys. Next thing we know is this man is arrested as a child molester. So sometimes God puts a check in your spirit, and he says, no, you can't do it you might have freedom to use the internet. You may have freedom to use a cell phone. But I had to counsel someone recently. I said, you need to get rid of your cell phone and go to a flip phone. Why? Because he's addicted to pornography. I said, if you're serious about this thing and you mean that you really want to walk with God, then take the steps. Ah, oh, it's inconvenient. I need to check my email during the day. Call your wife. I bet she would be glad to check your email for you because you want to live in holiness and in purity. Now, sometimes it's not always great. You know, Spurgeon, of course, was known for smoking his cigars. And most of the pastors in his day called him out on that, said he was wrong. He said, I can quit anytime I want. It's in moderation. But even though they didn't have the same medical evidence and sciences, most of the pastors sensed he was right. Look, he, the guy died at 57. Who knows the years he may have taken away because of some decisions that he made. That's not to discredit Spurgeon. But there are biblical principles. So, you know, do I have a text that says, thou shalt not smoke a cigarette? Of course not. Do I think it's wrong for me to smoke a cigarette? Of course I do. Why? Because my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, it's harmful to you. So though I don't have a text, I have a principle that God has given me. You know, I hear some of these pastors sometimes use movies that they've watched for illustrations. I think, where are these guys? They got their head in the garbage bin. Because some of the movies they are referencing, Jesus Christ would never see with them. So it's not a matter of, you know, you can watch this movie and you can't watch it. I, I watched a movie two nights ago with two of my granddaughters about this dog called Christmas. It was a great movie. I enjoyed it. It was fun. Sure, we screened it. We wanted to make sure it was okay. So I'm not saying all movies are sinful. I remember talking to Dr. Jerry Falwell. He, Jerry Stokes had invited him to come and speak at a wildlife supper, and we were chatting a little bit, and I, we, we, we ran the gamut of topics, and 
that night I said, now, Dr. Falwell, you don't need to wear your suit to this. If you said, look, I go to the beach in a suit. I'll never forget that. I, I go to the beach in the suit, you know? And, uh, but, um, you know, he said, I've only been to a few movies in my whole life. That was just his conviction. He didn't want to soil his mind. And, you know, these Christian organizations who supposedly screen movies for you. Yeah, well, we watched this R-rated movie, and this word was in it, and that was, and this small sex scene. Why would I trust an idiot like that to screen a movie for me? He's got his mind in the garbage pail, and he's going to have discernment to screen a movie for me? I don't think so. So again, there are biblical principles. And so God gives us a principle in Philippians 4. The things that are true and right and honorable and worthy of praise, set your mind on these kinds of things. And yeah, it's really hard to find good movies in our day. But you know, it's not all that bad to read a book occasionally. (laughs) So um, he's giving us some principles. It's like the wife who... Husband calls out, hey, honey, is this shirt okay for me to wear? It's, uh, what do you think? And is it clean enough for me to wear? And she said, no, don't wear it. So he puts on another shirt and comes out. How's this one? Oh, that's perfect. You didn't even come in and look at the other one. How did you know it was bad? Well, look, if you had doubt in your mind, it was bad. If it's dirty, don't wear it. And so there there are principles like when in doubt, cut it out. And that's what he's going to draw out in verses 22 and 23 here in this chapter. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith and whatever is not from faith is sin. So back here in verse 14, for if because of food your brother is hurt, you can't say, well, he'll get over it. No, you're no longer walking according to love. Love and knowledge are bled together. So I have a friend who cannot eat in a restaurant where there's alcohol served. It's just too big a stumbling block for him. He came out of an alcohol background, and for him just to smell the aroma of the beer and everything else, it's too much for him. Now, he would never go with me. He doesn't live here anymore, but when the Applebee's opened, he said, no, I can't go there. You know, years ago when I came to Beaufort, we didn't have anything here. I and mean, we had a Kmart and a Walmart, I think a Bojangles, and just uh, there was very few things here. And so when a new restaurant would open up, it's just like everybody in town went to the new restaurant because there had never been such a restaurant. Applebee's opened up and the place was packed for months. And then another Golden Corral opened and that place was packed for months. And we'd go from, you know, these, I don't have a problem. I didn't have a problem going with Applebee's. In fact, I went into Applebee's in the early days when they opened and it was so packed, they said, well, the only place we can sit you is right here in the region of the bar. I said, I'll take it. And I led your father-in-law to Christ 10 feet from the bar. So again, what God says to some people you can't do, you have freedom to do, but you don't take your freedom and hurt your brother with that freedom. Otherwise, you're no longer walking according to love. And that's what God tells us to do. It's not an issue, I don't care what anybody thinks. The issue is, am I walking according to love? And so he explains it further in verse 16. Therefore, do not let for what is for you a good thing be spoken of as blasphemeo, evil. We get our word blasphemy from it. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So again, the, the kingdom of God is, is, is something that we are to exercise in a way that builds up the body of Christ and not tear us them down. So, you know, sometimes Christians, they can get weird. Oh, you celebrate Christmas, Pastor Bergie, I won't come to this church. A guy in Graniteville told us he left over that issue. <laughs> okay. You know, I wasn't trying to create a stumbling block for him. 
Some Christians, you know, I get the calls in the Bible on, what do you think of Halloween? You know, it's the devil's holiday. Someone shows up at your door and you give them a candy. You're giving that child an offering to the devil. I'm not giving the child an offering to the devil. I'm giving them a candy bar and a tract typically, a gospel tract on how that child can find Christ as their savior and probably the only one who'll receive that night. But sometimes Christians get somewhat superstitious, just like just like those brothers in Corinth got superstitious over buying food, perfectly good meat, from an idol temple. But Paul says, if you take your freedom and buy it, you tear down your brother, you're not walking according to the love. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy of the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God, verse 18, and approved by men, verse 19. So then we pursue the things which make for peace and for building up one another. We're to be peacemakers, not division makers. Verse 20, do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean. In other words, in God's eyes, there's, there's no distinction between clean and unclean meats. And the Jerusalem council affirmed that. The one restriction on food eating in the Jerusalem council was drinking blood. Because blood is sacred in God's mind. He wasn't talking about eating a rare steak. But he's talking about... Like blood sausage might be comparable in our day. But you do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. Then he says in verse 21, it is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. Now there's another issue, a gray area, so to speak. Should we drink wine? Some Christians would say that I'm legalistic for, being, for exercising abstinence. Well, that's okay. We've never made alcohol, if someone has a glass of wine or a beer, an issue for membership. It is an issue for leadership. If someone wants to serve with youth or in other capacities, but it's never been an issue for membership. But why do I teach abstinence? Why did Christians for hundreds and hundreds of years teach abstinence? Why did Moody Bible Institute teach abstinence? Because they were just coming out of a prohibition age? Not on your life. That's an argument of ignorance. Why did Lewis Berry Chafer and John Walford, the first two presidents of Dallas Theological Seminary, teach abstinence? For theological, biblical reasons. These guys were not ignoramuses. There are some of the brightest theologians of the 20th century. The scripture does not condemn the use of alcohol. It condemns the use of drunkenness, of becoming drunk in the use of strong drink. And if you're new here, let me just say, especially for those who are live streaming, strong drink, biblically speaking, is raw fermented wine or beer. It's not whiskey or rum or the distilled alcohols that don't come nearly a thousand years after the Bible is completed. Those weren't even in view. Before you can apply any text of Scripture, you have to go back to the original audience and say, how would the original audience have understood this? So when you read some of the intertestament literature, like um, uh, the Didash and the um, Talmud and different midrashes and 2 Maccabees, some of the intertestament books, 2 Maccabees 15 says it's not good to drink wine only, it's not good to drink water only, but to mix the two. What was that coming out of? The Jewish culture. When in the famous rabbinical manual that rabbis would study under, because they didn't want to be guilty of drinking strong drink, they were told they were to mix their wine in a five to one ratio, five parts water, one part wine. Understand the word oinos, wine, the Hebrew word yayin, could refer to a fresh grape squeeze. They would call that wine. They didn't call it grape juice, they called it wine. But it could also turn fermented, and they use the same term. But sometimes it would be distinguished with the term strong drink. And so God makes it clear that a believer is not to use strong drink. 
Well, I use it in moderation. That's like saying I use cocaine in moderation. The exception, of course, in Proverbs 31 was that you could give it to a dying, despairing man, much like we would give a painkiller to a person who's in agony as an act of mercy. It wasn't considered a sinful thing to do. Wine, Psalm 104, speaks about how it gladdens the heart. And people love to camp on a verse like, see, it gladdens the heart. God wants me to have a buzz. No, he doesn't. In fact, 152 times that Hebrew word is used, it is never once used in reference to some kind of a high. It's talking about the blessing in Psalm 104 of bread and wine because they were staples. Bread was like the food in the Jewish culture to survive and in the Greek world. And wine was absolutely necessary because the water was typically impure. And it was a very involved process to boil water all the time, to heat it up. It's not like you turn on the stove or the gas burner, you built the fire. You, I mean, it was a big schmeal. And so within wine, there's ingredients called polyphenols. And polyphenols within 30 seconds to 10 minutes kills all the bacteria in, wa in water. Dr. Lister, who uh, was a committed Christian, discovered this in the 1800s. It was known way before that because the Good Samaritan knew it. He poured wine in the cot. Why? Because it made uh, the bacteria dead. He put oil before he put on the Band-Aid. And so Dr. Lister understood that there were polyphenols in wine that would kill bacteria. And, um, you know, Listerine. It's named after that fella. Um, another famous physician, also a born-again Christian, Robert Johnson, understood this principle. And so during the First World War, he um, was the first one to present sterilized bandages. And they, uh, the French army uh, greatly benefited from his instruction as they poured wine on the cots. They put bandages that were, uh, had oil in them and so that they wouldn't stick to the wound. And it was all part, of course, Johnson & Johnson. You know, there, there's a lot of history behind some of these places. My, my, my point is, is that the burden of proof John Walford and all these guys were not stupid. What is characterizing the church today is sheer stupidity. Sad. But God's word, the burden of proof is on them to show otherwise. When you look at the Didache, which is a second century A.D., Christian pastoral manual. It's one of the oldest pieces of literature we have to this day outside of the scripture. It was a pastoral, when I became a pastor, my father-in-law gave me a pastoral manual. He said, this will be really helpful to you. I remember in the 1970s doing my first funeral. I, who's on first? I don't know. What do you do at a funeral? I did two yesterday. I mean, I didn't know. And so these were helpful tools, and they were helpful in the early centuries as well. Because older, wiser men who had walked down that road, and so that during the time of year when you didn't have fresh squeezed grapefruit, you didn't want to be guilty of using strong drink. And so in the Didache, it said you mixed it in a five to one ratio, five parts water, one part wine, lest you be guilty of using strong drink. So back here in your handout, I don't want to get too far afield here. So there's some just simple principles here. Again, on one side, you have the negative commands of Scripture. On the other side of this chart, you have the positive commands of Scripture. And then in between, you have what we might call the gray areas, the disputable matters, the non-absolutes of Scripture. And so what are the principles that guide me? One, I shouldn't do anything that might cause my brother to stumble. That would be enough right there for me as a pastor to teach abstinence. So some teenager comes into Applebee's and I'm having a glass of wine. That teenager thinks, well, Pastor Carl can have a glass of wine. 
He's a godly man. Why can't I have a glass of wine? So he mimics my example and he gets behind a car and he kills somebody. So I don't want to do anything that would cause someone to stumble. And again, just logically, it just makes sense. Look, don't tell me the first time you had a glass of wine, you didn't have a buzz because you did. And when you did that, you broke the greatest commandment. The greatest commandment is to love God with your whole heart, mind, and strength. When your mind is buzzed, you're breaking the greatest commandment. You say, well, I can have a glass of wine. It doesn't do that to me because you sinned repeatedly and you built up a resistance in your system through habitual use. It's just like the drug addict. He always has to go for something bigger. He starts on beer, starts on wine, the alcoholic. Before you know it, he's on vodka and rum and whiskey because that's the only way he can capture the high in the same amount of time. That's the nature of drugs. But I don't want to model anything that would cause someone to stumble. I don't want to do anything point B that I don't have a clear conscience to do. Why? Because whatever is not from faith is sin. I don't want to do anything that would not glorify God. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, Paul says, do all to the glory of God. I remember my mother-in-law. Maybe she's live streaming tonight. She's 87 years old and she live streams most of our services because of this situation with their church and they don't have the technology that we have in that country church. And, but she was at a Christmas party and uh, she was uh, having a drink, unspiked drink. And there were two drink things. One was spiked, the other was non-spiked. And she didn't want the alcohol. Her convictions went great. Her father, her grandfather, I seen the copy of the Bible where they made a pledge for abstinence. That was typical. I went into Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. A friend of mine pastors it. I've known him since he was 18 years old. And on the back wall, there's an abstinence chart that all the members agreed. Not anymore. So I went to a 4th of July cookout for the same church, and most of the people were buzzed and high. It's sad. It's very sad. My son and his wife there in the D.C. area, they're one of the few couples along with some, of, some former members from this church, including a Marine Corps former general, head of the Secret Service, he didn't drink, nor did his wife when they were members of that church. But it said, they, said, they said to me one day, we've seen few of our members who at one time or another didn't have too much. See, that's what happens. I'm just going to have one beer. One turns into three. And again, you don't sin until you build up a resistance. It's just a bad thing in our day. And I don't know of any Christian that God, I don't know of one that God is using to introduce people into the kingdom who preach with any power or authority who use alcohol. I know none. So one of my sons who just graduated from law school and is taking the bar next week, he goes to rent from one of the members an elder of the church. Supposedly the elders don't drink, but when I helped him to move into that place, he had cases of the Corona beer. Cases of it. What a name, Corona. Huh. I hear it's not doing too well right now. Cases of it. And he's just a sophomore in college. But he had convictions. He said, Dad, this doesn't make sense to me. I know. So my, back to my mother-in-law. You thought I forgot I didn't. <laughs> the lady came up to her and said, hey, this is kind of good. We can get a little bit of high and nobody here from the church to see us. See, she assumed 
she was drinking what this lady was drinking. She said it was a reminder to her that she really wanted to guard her testimony, that she didn't want anyone to misunderstood what she was drinking. Why? Because she wanted to glorify God. Look, the scripture says in 1 Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from every appearance of evil. Some things are not evil, but they, abs- they appear to be evil. And so when couples come in and we do premarital counseling and they have six one-hour appointments and they have about 15 hours of homework and they fill out a form, you know, which I think most of the time they answer, honest, answer honestly, I believe the best. You know, what kind of physical involvement are you having? And I remind them, I said, abstain from everything that appears evil. Example, you invite him over to your house for a nice dinner you want to make. And it's just you and him in the apartment for three hours. But your neighbor sees you go in, come out three hours later. What are they going to think? In our day of low sexual morals, I'll tell you what they'll think. They'll think that you've been immoral. So you abstain from every appearance of evil. When I used to work for Campus Crusade, now called Crew, and they're going down the tubes in the alcohol area, Dr. Bill Bright would not allow a staff member to use alcohol. Now one of the national directors that I spoke with in the last two months told me he was at the national, a national meeting with like leaders where wine was flowing. See, we've gone into license. Don't talk to me about legalism. We've gone into license in our day. I'll leave this topic out. My blood pressure will go up. (laughs) Sin uh, is described in terms of absolute terms, attitudes, and then God gives us these gray areas. And so if you even apply these principles, I don't want to cause a brother to stumble. Maybe someone's from an alcohol background. I don't want to model the use of alcohol or someone's never had it and I don't want to model them using it. What I can't do in faith or in a clear conscience I shouldn't do if it doesn't glorify God. Why would I want to give 10 cents to the alcohol industry of this day? It is an evil industry in this nation. Look what they do at those spring breaks. They're destroying young people in this nation. Why would I want to give 10 cents to Budweiser? I wouldn't. And whatever is not from faith is sin and does it glorify God. And then sin is judged in the unbeliever. Point C there in your outline. Sin is judged in the unbeliever. God will someday judge all sin. And if we don't flee to Christ, he will judge it in us for all of eternity. Whereas sin is disciplined in the believer, point D. In the past, God deals with us as sinners. In the future, he will deal with us as stewards. We give an account of our stewardship. But in the present, he deals with us as sons. And so in Hebrews chapter 4, it's an important text. Why don't we just turn there for a second? Maybe we'll conclude with this. Hebrews chapter 4, book of Hebrews, written to Jewish believers. And he quotes from the book of Proverbs a very important text, or Hebrews 12, verse 4. And uh, notice what he says. He says, um, For you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, all true believers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he, God, disciplines us for our good that we might share his holiness. All discipline 
from the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, yet for those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Now understand, the use of discipline in the New Testament is not always in reference to someone who's in sin. And that's not the major focus in the book of Hebrews. These were Jewish people because they said Yeshua Hamasiach is the Messiah. Their businesses were boycotted. They were ostracized. They were disowned. And the writer of the Hebrews reminds us that God uses discipline for our good. He, he shapes us with it. Just like a dad uses corporal discipline to shape his child. He assumes dads spank their kids. And not with the hand. God uses a separate instrument in Scripture. It's never abusive. But there's an assumption that there's discipline to help a child to understand what's right and what's wrong. And in the New Testament, there's also discipline that God brings in terms of sin. Sometimes you're right in the center of God's will and he's disciplining you. Why? Because he's shaping you into Christ's image. Sometimes you're out of God's will and he disciplines you. And that's not because he hates you, but because he loves you. And so in the past, he dealt with us as sinners. And we come to the cross and we receive the one who took our place. In the future, he'll deal with us as stewards when we give an account for all of our service in Christ. But in the current time, he deals with us as with sons. You see examples in Acts 5, 1 through 11, Ananias and Sapphira. They're disciplined by God. You'll meet Ananias and Sapphira in heaven someday. They knew the Lord. They loved the Lord, but they got arrogant at one point. And they wanted to be big shots. And they lied in the process to the apostles. And God took them. Imagine if God took every person who lied today, we wouldn't have any church members, would we? <laughs> and the Corinthians, they're disciplined by God. We read that verse already, 1 Corinthians 11.30. We could have added 1 John 5, 16, a common Bible question verse. There's a sin that leads to death where he talks about physical death. Sometimes God takes us physically. Well, we will end it there and uh, next week pick up with the doctrine of temptation. Let me just close this in prayer. I'll close this tonight. Thank you for those who've been asked and if you'll commit yourself to those. Father, thank you tonight for the time that we've shared together. You've called us to be holy, not to be worldly. And yet we are living in a time that you said would come when men's hearts would grow cold and sin would abound, where lawlessness would increase. Because we know that's what a lukewarm church produces when the light is gone and the salt is lost. But we thank you that you love us with an everlasting love and remind us, Father, that that love should never be turned into license, but a passion to live holy for you.